front of school. Good. <sighs> My husband's written this. I hope that's within the rules. So I'll, I'll give you his words because I think they're really important. It's, the men are fighting this as well and it's really difficult. Um, she's my stepdaughter, I don't have a lot of a voice. Um, but this has impacted our family in ways that I don't think the average person would understand unless we can somehow tell our story. We'd like to share with you our experience at the Women's and Children Gender Click Clinic here in Adelaide. Between 2019 and 2021, our once very happy and girly daughter had started to become withdrawn and very conscious of her changing body, wearing baggy clothes, nothing her older sister hadn't done, seemingly normal pre-pubertal behaviour. Around March 2021, at 10 years old, she came out as trans, identifying as a boy, wanting to use a boy's name and pronouns. When I asked why she felt like this way, she said it was because she didn't like the way women are treated. My concern was that this wasn't about gender identity. It was a response to learning what it can mean to be a woman. I wanted her to see a counsellor. Her mother, my ex, his ex, preferred to affirm the gender and get a referral to the gender clinic because her reading told her that how you prevent suicide in an adolescent um, with gender dysphoria. We saw a social worker on an initial intake at the clinic. I asked for a follow-up appointment for my daughter and a phone call so I could air my perspective without my daughter in the room. That appointment and that call never came. In her first 45-minute psychiatric interview, six weeks later, I raised the question of motive, of root cause for my daughter's distress. By now well aware that talking about the fear of being a woman wouldn't get her what she wanted, my daughter played it down, emphasising her dysphoria. Eventually, she did say she didn't like the way women are treating, especially that men rape women. Has anything like that ever happened to you? Asked the psychiatrist. Not really, my daughter said. Did this mandatory reporter treat that as a red flag? No, she just suggested my daughter talk to her mum about it and never mentioned it again. At the second 45-minute appointment with the psychiatrist, a diagnosis of gender dysphoria was announced and in front of my kid, puberty blockers were recommended. When asked for my consent, I said I had concerns but was cajoled into the next appointment trying to avoid increasing my own daughter's distress. In the gender clinic's mind, we're in a race against the clock. Now approaching 12 years of age, puberty was around the corner, that my daughter had flipped from identifying for a boy to being gender fluid to non-binary and was on the third name change, was of no concern. There was no effort to explore family dynamics, developmental history and pre-existing mental health conditions and all that other stuff in the OSPATH guidelines. The clock was ticking for them. At the next appointment with a paediatrician, the puberty block of fact sheet was summarised for us. The only risks to be worried about, apparently, were bone density loss, unknown outcomes for height, and a sore arm. That's it. And can you please sign here, and we'll proceed. All in front of the child. When I asked about the other risks on the fact sheet, the hot flushes, tiredness, mood changes, the unknown short and long-term effects on social and cognitive development, I was told there was not enough data. Why is there not enough data? Because there's never been a controlled study into the use of puberty blockers for the treatment of gender dysphoria. The drug company does not list gender dysphoria as one of the conditions the drug is intended to treat. Its use for this purpose is off-label and therefore experimental. Had enough information been divulged for informed consent? Hell no. Especially making sure the 11-year-old knew what she was agreeing to. The consent form asked for her to sign it. When I asked for a treatment plan, I learned that the women's and children's idea of ongoing mental health support and mine were poles apart. Once a month psych appointments, once every two months, try an assessment once every six months, and we recommend patients obtain private counselling. 
In short, the gender clinic is delivering treatment for which it isn't resource to provide the necessary ongoing support. Even though they said they provide ongoing mental health support in a recent statement to a member of the South Australian Legislative Council. They've said that out loud and they lied. There is no ongoing mental health support for children going to the gender, gender clinic. My husband was excluded from the next psychiatric appointment, whether by his daughter's mother or by the clinic or both, we'll never know. By now, he'd submitted in writing that he didn't consent to the treatment. From my understanding of the OSPAP guidelines and any information I could track down on the internet, I thought this would mean court authorisation would be needed for them to proceed. But no. The issue was escalated to the Women's and Children's Ethics Committee, who authorised treatment to proceed without my consent. That's right. To stop my daughter receiving experimental treatment, I would have to take it to a federal court. I sought legal advice and that advice that I'd be wasting my time and tens of thousands of dollars to do so. The family court could be expected to request a second opinion and that second opinion would come from the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne, our foremost proponents of gender affirming care. In the end, it was my husband who had to sit down with his 11 year old daughter and ensure she understood the risks. He read her the fact sheet line by line, took her through the drug company literature, explained what osteoporosis means, explained what it means to not able to experience an orgasm. At 11, I told her again that there's a broad spectrum of femininity, that female puberty is daunting but transformative, and that I would fully support her in that journey of self-discovery but please don't let them use drugs to interfere with that process. In the end, the day before the first injection, my daughter decided not to proceed. Within days, her sleep and anxiety levels improved. The cutting and the talk of suicide stopped. Today, our daughter identifies as non-binary, goes by a gender-fluid name, her fourth name in two years, uses they, them pronouns. They continue to develop in their own unique way, and I'll always love them for whoever they are. But we dodged a bullet, there's no doubt about it. In October 2019, the National Association of Practicing Psychiatrists wrote to the then Federal Minister, Mr Greg Hunt, requesting a parliamentary inquiry into the treatment of gender dysphoria in Australia. In their words, not mine, the current approach to the treatment of gender dysphoria in children and adolescents under the age of 18 has become a controversial subject within the medical community. Today, I call on our current Federal Health Minister, the Honourable Mr Mark Butler MP, to follow through on that request. Our gender clinics have allowed ideology to overtake their duty of care and the guiding principle to first do no harm and our children deserve better.